launched by NASA on September 5, 1977, Voyager 1's primary mission was to provide detailed images of Jupiter, Saturn, and their moons. It took this photograph of Jupiter on its journey. In August of 2012, Voyager 1 entered interstellar space, the first human-made object to do so. It is expected to send data and images back to Earth until 2025. Such a technological feat has a lot to do with economic principles. The technology of today is a spillover product of the incredible feats accomplished by NASA 30 years ago. These spillovers lead us into the topics of the chapter, technology, positive externalities, public goods, and the role of government in supporting innovation, and the social benefits stemming from innovation. Does competition in the marketplace encourage or discourage innovation in technology? It all depends on the ability of the innovator to make a profit off of the efforts to innovate. If the profit is not there, then the te technology is slow in coming. For example, here are some inventors whose inventions brought them less profit than they might have reasonably expected. What is this invention and who invented it? This is an early prototype of an automatic voting machine. Thomas Edison invented it, but was never able to find demand for it. The laser was invented by Gordon Gould. But even after a long and expensive court battle over a patent, he never realized much financial reward. This invention is the cotton gin, which was re-engineered by competitors, so the inventor Eli Whitney never had the full financial benefits of his intellectual property. Finally, Alan Turing set the stage for the modern computer, which was later called the Universal Turing Machine. All of these inventors created something that benefits, benefited society, but were unable to receive the full financial reward for their contributions. Indeed, a variety of studies by economists have found that the original inventor receives one-third to one-half of the total economic benefits for inventions, while other businesses and new product users receive the rest of the benefits. This positive spillover is termed a positive externality. Here is an example of a positive externality occurring from the invention of a new drug. Big Drug, a company, faces a cost of borrowing of 8%. If the firm receives only the private benefits of investing in research and development, then its demand curve for financial capital is shown by D private demand, private demand for capital. And the equilibrium will occur at $30 million. Because there are spillover benefits, society would find it optimal to have $52 million of investment in research and development by Big Drug. If the firm could keep the social benefits of its investment for itself, its demand curve for financial capital would be de-social or the demand for that society would prefer. It would be willing to borrow $52 million. Here's another example of a positive externality spilling over from the use of flu shots. This example answers the question, how can the government help support goods and services that have ex positive externalities for society? So the, modern, the, the market demand curve does not reflect the positive externality of flu vaccinations. Many people get flu shots. Many people don't. The positive externality are realized by those who don't get the flu shot, but don't get the flu because people who have the flu shot didn't contract it and pass it on to them. So only Q market, which is the quantity that the current market is at, will be exchanged. So that's the current market quantity. This outcome is inefficient because the marginal society benefit exceeds the marginal social cost. 
If the government provides a subsidy to consumers for flu shots equal to the marginal social benefit minus the marginal private benefit, the level of vaccinations can increase to the socially optimal quantity of Q social. In other words, it increases the demand by subsidizing something with a positive externality. A society and the rule of law can encourage innovation by allowing for and protecting intellectual property rights in the form of patents, copyrights, and trademarks. It makes investing in innovation a less riskier thing because inventors know that they can recuperate their investment once their research and development is fruitful. The government can encourage innovation by investing public funds into research and development projects such as NASA projects that lead to new technologies. It can also encourage innovation by giving tax breaks to those who innovate. Last of all, the government can encourage innovation by teaming up with private industry to cooperate and share research and technology. Such cooperation can lead to inventions like the internet. The openness and availability of research and information provided by the internet has led to even more innovation. The number of applications, for example, filed for patents increased substantially from the mid-90s into the first years of 2000 due in part to the invention of the internet, which has led to many other inventions and to the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act. As information and in turn innovation become more public, we see the dynamics of public goods come to the forefront. Public goods are those that people are not excluded from or non-excludable. For example, a public park can be used by all and people are not typically charged to enter or excluded for one reason or another. Public goods are also non-rivalrous, which means that if someone is using a public good, others can use it simultaneously. The public park example fits this characteristic of public goods because the park can be used simultaneously by many people. One problem that comes out of a public good is a use by free riders or by those who do not help pay for the establishment and upkeep of the public good. A public good is not without cost to society. But are all who benefit from it helping to cover the cost? This is typically the main challenge for items with positive externalities and for public goods. Not everyone pays for the benefits they receive.